Today is Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. Hello, Feedlings. Happy New Year, and how the hell are you? Yes, I've been gone for a little while, but there's so much to do. I'm currently writing Station 3 for Severed Press while I write and record The Black Oceania serial for my Patreon, Ko-Fi, and Buy Me a Coffee patrons. As soon as I get over my stage fright and record the video for the YouTube memberships, I'll activate those as well. If you don't know what The Black is, well, you better get over to shadowpublications.com slash the-black and take a gander at their description. Listen to the podcast or buy the audiobook. Then keep going. Now it's time for me to introduce this month's story. It was originally written for the Contact This anthology and managed to join the group of crazy and unconventional tales in that collection. Highly recommend you get a hold of it if you want some strange First Contact style stories. I wrote Whispers about six or eight months following writing Jury Rigged for another anthology. If you've read the Derelict Saga, you know that combat suits can be like second skins. They can be sentient, interactive, or dumb as metal armor. For humans exposed to the vacuum of space, it's extremes of both heat and cold. The suit is the only item that saves them from death. Upon finishing Whispers, I realized I already had two pretty good stories for a short story collection about suits. I now have three stories for that collection, but I'll explain that some other time. You might notice some callbacks to Derelict here, and I guess I should address that. Whispers takes place in a far, far future when compared to the Derelict Saga, so I'll just say it's a soul and beyond story and leave it at that. Enough of my babbling, let's meet Vaughn and Suit. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode one of Whispers. Vaughn came to with a start, an emotionless voice calmly telling him that cabin pressure had been compromised. Once his eyes focused, he saw why. The front half of the shuttle had been shorn off. It was just gone, affording him a horizon of distant stars glittering like chips of ice on a blanket of darkness. From what little he could see from Suit's emergency lights, they'd landed on a big rock. The stars, however, weren't moving weren't panning at all. His vision darkened for a moment, the stars becoming dim before returning to normal. He blinked hard and tried to clear the fuzz in his head. A suit protected you from a lot of damage, but the manufacturers still hadn't figured out a way to keep your brain from sliding around, and this was definitely a concussion. He slowly moved his neck, testing for an injury. It was stiff, but still moved. Good. He turned his head to look starboard. Two of the flight seats were still occupied. Vaughn activated his comms. Hey, you there? Nothing. Using his block, he attempted an emergency connection, broadcasting on any bands their suits might be tuned to. Hey! Nothing. Frustrated, he attempted a comms link to the suit next to him. He might not get through, but he did at least know if the suit was still functional. It didn't respond. He flipped on his suit lights, banishing the thick nest of shadows. The seats were occupied, but the occupants were no longer living. A piece of debris the size of a fist had slammed through the first Marine's combat armor, continuing until it rammed through his back and the seat itself. The second deceased occupant's helmet remained attached only because a cord of tendons remained intact, while most of the head had been removed at the neck. Dead. All dead, he croaked. Dollops of frozen blood stuck to the bulkhead like a child's finger painting. A wave of nausea roiled in his belly. He dry heaved twice before managing to get it under control. The last thing he wanted to do was puke in a combat suit. Particularly when your shuttle was ripped in half, everyone was dead, and you had no hope of repressurizing the cabin. Repressurize? Fix? Find shelter? Did they know where he was? Was anyone coming? Was... The thoughts began to spiral in his mind before merging, melding, becoming a ceaseless clamor of gibberish. He closed his eyes. He suddenly felt very cold and sleepy. Administering adrenaline, Suit advised him. 
A tingling sensation started in his left forearm and transformed into a liquid blanket of welcome warmth. Vaughn sighed and his eyes snapped open. The vibration of his heart thumping a strong, rapid beat seemed to light his mind. Just as it's supposed to, he said aloud, a manic grin spreading across his face. Vaughn felt for the manual mag release, found it, and pulled. The powerful electromagnets holding him in place powered down in an instant. Suit detached, the mechanical voice said in his headset. Yeah, no shit, he told it. Vaughn blinked hard twice, doing his best to both clear his vision and his head. The drugs helped, but his brain still seemed coated in a thin layer of fuzz. He turned to the side and gave the two dead bodies one last look. PFC Thomas Reed would never growl at Vaughn again to move his ass and get it in gear. Didn't like you, Reed, he said, and gently touched the corpse's shoulder. But no one deserves to go out like that. The dead body said nothing. Private Lowe, dumbass that he was, would never get another chance to almost space himself by entering an airlock without his helmet. He'd also never had the chance to wear a helmet ever again. Vaughn said one more silent farewell before tapping his toes. He rose a few millimeters in the low gravity and quickly used his suit jets to keep himself from hitting the twisted metal that had become the shuttle's ceiling. With the front of the shuttle sheared off by whatever had hit them, the main comms array was gone. He peered around the fractured cabin, his eyes darting to find the emergency kit. It didn't take long to find it, or rather, what was left of it. Whatever had gone through Reed had also blown a ragged hole in the shuttle's aft section. The emergency supply cabinet was little more than a twisted hunk of metal, frozen water droplets, suit nutrition packs, and the detritus of obliterated equipment. No oxygenated survival tent, no emergency comms package, no antenna. He was fucked. Suit, is the emergency beacon active? The voice responded immediately with, No, the emergency beacon is not active. It could just be the concussion, but he thought that Suit sounded morose. Well, Suit, we're fucked. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Shut up, he said with a roll of his eyes. A fierce flame of tingles rose from his chest to his head. Oh, good, he thought. The side effects from the drugs were finally kicking in. This was the part he hated. It wasn't the first time a suit had flooded his system with a survival cocktail, and it was an experience you never forgot. Even now, he saw what looked like a ghostly bouquet of glowing flowers at the front of the wrecked shuttle. Hallucinations. Great. Vaughn sighed heavily and closed his eyes, but it didn't help. The flowers were still there as if they'd been behind his eyelids the entire time. He waited for the images to fade, but the wavering petals merely dimmed slightly. Must be one hell of a concussion, he thought. A low ache began at the base of his neck, and he groaned. He knew that sensation all too well, and in ten minutes or so, it would move into his skull. Suit would give him another liquid cocktail, something to take the edge off, but it still wouldn't make the pain disappear, only mute it. What's the point, he said to no one. Going to be dead soon anyway. An ironic grin crossed his face. R&R. &R. They were supposed to be on their way to Hooker Station, the unofficial name for the military-civilian complex parked near SETI Prime. He had no idea how far away they were from their intended destination. <laughs> Didn't matter. No supplies. He eyed both Reed's and Lowe's suits and smiled. Reed's suit was damaged so badly that even the atmosphere tanks had been shattered. Lowe's, on the other hand, was nearly intact. Too bad you couldn't say the same thing about the helmet, much less Lowe's neck and head. But a quick study told him they were too damaged to be of any use. Vaughn reactivated Suit's magnetics and Glove walked his way across the jump seats until he hovered directly behind Lowe. It took a few moments for him to detach the tanks as well as the catalyzer. He stuffed them into his pouch and thanked the void that combat suits, including weapons, were required for any journey regardless of whether it was a combat zone or for R&R &R at Hooker Station. At least I won't need the weapons, he thought. A shiver crawled down his spine. Why did he have to think that? With that in mind, he located the weapons rack. 
The emergency equipment might be gone, but look at that. Weapons. He pulled one from the rack, held it against Suit's arm, and the rifle locked to the limb. Suit announced the weapon was connected and ready to receive orders. Good. At least something was going right. He then turned and faced the rip bow once again. After maglocking himself to the shuttle's deck, he walked with smooth, heel-to-toe strides, the boots engaging and disengaging their magnetics in an easy rhythm. As he covered the two meters separating him from the already blown open emergency hatch, ripples of goose flesh made him shiver again, and the low ache in his head increased. What the fuck had they hit? It hadn't been a missile or beam weapon. Beams burned holes in Atmo steel like a welding torch through butter. A direct missile hit would have destroyed them instantly, unless it had detonated prematurely due to chaff clouds. The pilots, however, would have shouted. Hell, Suit would have warned him, since the shuttle's computers spoke directly to each combat suit. There should have been a warning. Something. No missile. No beam. Where the rest of the shuttle should be was little more than twisted metal. No burn marks. No scorch marks. Something had messily cleaved the shuttle with all the skill of a clumsy child wielding a dull chainsaw. Oxygen reserves at 95%, Suit said. Vaughn's look of wonder and confusion dissipated. He needed to get moving unless he wanted to die in this shell. Well, he was going to be dead anyway, but he wasn't quite ready to eat a pulse. Not yet. Or maybe he'd just expel all his breath, pull off his helmet, and finally meet space, face to face. It wouldn't take long. Probably a minute or two of agony. Suit could, of course, provide him with something to take the edge off first. Maybe he'd greet the vacuum high as a kite, calm, serene, at peace. Yeah, good luck with that. With careful steps, he marched out of the broken shuttle and onto rocky red ground. Or was it orange? Or brown? The surface looked volcanic, irregular. A short distance away, a wall of mineral rose several meters above the surface, its edge curled out into a shallow overhang. Instead of a single hue, striations of blues, pinks, golds, and greens wove their way through the predominantly brown, dark yellow, and orange rock. Vaughn continued stepping gently, eyes flicking from one cam feed to the other. He thought the gravity was just enough to keep him from flying off the surface, but he didn't want to test that hypothesis. The world was awash in shadows that terminated in the most star-filled sky he'd ever seen. With a slight shudder of fear, he closed his eyes, killed Suit's lights, waited a few beats, and then opened his eyes again. The darkness wasn't as oppressive once his eyes adjusted, but it was still a deep twilight. Except it wasn't. Far from it. Suit's lights had masked a faint eldritch glow in the direction of what he thought of as east. He blinked twice in that direction. The shuttle. Maybe the shuttle's bow had crash-landed too, and maybe the beacon was damaged but working. Hell, maybe some of the survival supplies were still intact. A genuine emotion managed its way through the cloud of drugs in his system. He was grinning as he trudged across the rocky yet giving ground toward the glow.